Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Genova Burns, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., Peoples United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. It's Queens. It's a neighborhood with all these different people from around the world. Lots of things are happening in Queens. So today, due to the help of my executive producer, Mr. Donovan, we've assembled a group of Queens leaders to talk about what's happening in Queens. As I said, my guests include Tom Donovan, who's the vice chairman for the Queens Division of Cushman and Wakefield, Hasco Elias, who's the principal of the Hasco Group, Alan Rosenberg, who is the principal of Al Rose Group. And last but not least, Michael Meyer, who's the president of f and Group. So since you've helped me assemble this group, what's going on in the borough of Queens? Um, Queens finally is starting to become sexy. Queens is starting to get the artists, it's starting to get people coming into town, people coming to That's why you moved to the city, right? That's why I moved to Manhattan. <laughs> But it got cool. I wasn't allowed there anymore. Right. So um, it's it's a great time to be in Queens. It's you know this tremendous transportation, uh, both roads, public transportation, airports. Although the airports aren't doing that, that well right now, um, people are coming in in droves. There's, I think eighteen thousand new apartments in Northern Queens slated to come on market in the next two years or so. The most diverse county in the world. How many years have you been involved with Queens, Haskell? Over forty years. So how have you seen the difference over the last couple of years? I mean, we do know he's older than you, so he's been involved with Queens close to 50 years. I'll pick on Rosenberg. I I started there back in the early 70s, actually. I started in the Jackson Heights area, and then I emerged into the Forest Hills area, which I operated movie theaters at the time and restaurants, nightclubs in the area. And I started indulging into the real estate. And I had developed over nine properties on the same street. We brought in the big tenants with a... It was Disney or Regal Theaters, Ann Taylor, Ann Taylor Loft, Gap, AT&T, Verizon. Is that in Regal Park? Most this is all in the Forest Hills area, all in Austin Street. So when I started in the 70s, that entire street was really car services with the Exxon gas station and the Gulf gas stations that I remodeled and put in big retail stores in there. And... Um, that was the progress, and once I reached to a point where there was no other developments in the last, probably since 2012, 
I started moving into the city doing other things in Manhattan and we recently just got involved in Jackson Heights. Uh, so what's the difference between Jackson Heights and Regal Park? I mean, being a Brooklyn boy originally, you know, to be in Forest Hills, <laughs> Austin Street, that was a neighborhood. That was a really nice neighborhood. Right. You know, you weren't far from the gardens, okay? It was always, you had a couple of movie theaters, as you said. Correct. But it was, a, you know, good trains over there. You had the E train, you had the other trains. So it was great transportation to the city. How do you look at the change of Kew Gardens, Forest Hills to Jackson, Jackson Heights. Heights is a lot more dense, number one. Number two, it is all maybe 20 blocks, has very good transportation to the city. It does not have the railroad, but has very good subway uh, transportation and bus transportation to it. So these people basically remain in that area. They don't go shopping outside the area. So they live in that area, eat in that area, and sleep in that area. So the Forest Hills crowd will go into Roseville Field. They'll take a car ride or go into Manhattan. These people don't do that. So they don't adventure. They remain there. It's more insulated and, Correct. and they're staying in the community, which in a way, if we go to you in Flushing, I mean, you've been involved for, in Flushing for what, the last 12, 14 12, years? 13 years. 12 years. Yeah. How has Flushing changed? I, my, my wife grew up in Flushing. I remember Flushing being a totally different community. How about the flushing today and the flushing of 12 years ago? Well, it's radically different. It's really just the ascendancy of Asia and China is just, it parallels, uh, flushing just parallels it. Flushing is followed in all the different uh, Asian communities over there because they have such a big ex expat community in flushing and we're the beachhead. So in Taiwan, Korea, China, they all have immigration in, in uh, Flushing. So Jackson Heights and Flushing, I, uh, when I often talk, it's probably the most diverse neighborhoods in the entire country. And it is very insulated. But when you talk about how it's changed in 12 years, my understanding, speaking to old timers, was, uh, was Flushing at one point was really um, more of an Italian, middle class, almost suburban uh, neighborhood in the 50s and the 60s. The RKO Keith Theater, which is shuttered now and may be developed, was the center. Right now, when people come to visit me, I say, welcome to China. Uh, half of my job is giving tours of Flushing has, become, has come of age. People want to come. They, it's on the map. They hear that it has other now, what, what, restaurants what, what, what and so forth. What are your company involved with currently in Flushing? Well, because I know you built a hotel a couple years ago. That was, um, so Michael Lee and Sonny Chu are the founders, originally from Taiwan. I joined them about 12 years ago to particularly go after the RFP that the city put out for the municipal parking lot. That's now a project called Flushing Commons, big, huge, mixed juice, ultimately 1.8 million square feet gross. Right now we're just finishing up phase one. Two year, three years ago we finished what's called One Fulton Square, another mixed juice project. We built the first uh, Hyatt Hotel in all of Queens and uh, it's, it's a grand slam. But again, mixed use on the podium, uh, very, some very Chinese and very Asian, you always have the retail podium, and then you either have a uh, medical office on top, as we do in one of our towers at One Fulton, or we have the hotel in Flushing Commons where you have uh, residential and office. How active is the Flushing market for sales today? Probably the, the most desirable neighborhood in all of Queens. Just the density of people, the activity. The whole borough is diverse, as I said earlier. But, you know, northern Queens with the subways, you know, Jackson Heights, Flushing, you know, even into Bayside, because the, the osmosis of the neighborhood gets so dense in the center that it has to spill outward. Just a little fact to what Tom is talking about. Uh, on Main Street and, and where Roosevelt and Main intersect, they call it the 57th and 5th of, of, of uh, Queens. That it's the end of the number seven line. It's the busiest train station outside of Manhattan. Definitely. Uh, subway station. And in terms of pedestrian traffic, to your point, it's tied with third with like right behind um, Penn, Penn Station. First is Times Square, then Herald Square, and then Flushing Main Street. And, yeah. So we have to ask the boy who grew up in Brooklyn, <laughs> how many years have you been developing and what have you been doing now in, in Queens? In Queens? Um, I started out in Queens in the uh, early 90s on residential. Very quiet deals along Parsons Boulevard, around, uh, around uh, Jamaica, and more recently, I've gotten into Astoria. I, I did a life story on my show of uh, 
uh, of a Monsignor who said, I grew up in you know, Long Island City, Astoria. It's been an established, good working neighborhood all the time. Steinway Street with some great retail over there. It's always been there. It will continue for at least 100 years like that. It's just an amazing area. Proximity to the city, uh, a lot of new construction, great, great infrastructure. Do you, do you think, you know, with the... Great the, personality, sorry. Okay. With the planned uh, implementation of the new citywide ferry system, do you think Queens will even be stronger than before? I, I do. I think that coupled with the density and, and the renewed sexiness of, of the borough, it has to. There are certain parts like where Astoria Cove, where there's that planned development, you know, you're still a good 10 to 15 blocks from any form of rapid transportation. So having a, a ferry that could take you to Midtown, that would open up that whole Socrates Park and such for better transportation. What, what about you, since you've been active in retail, we haven't really had any chain stores. You haven't had a Target or... I, I don't see a breakthrough now in Astoria and... Uh, uh, driving through it and looking at it and all of that, I think uh, the trans if, if there's going to be a ferry transportation, the talk was from Astoria, uh, that would help it. But it's more of a bedroom community rather than the big businesses. Yet in Jackson Heights, we were able to lure the big companies in because it's a smaller space. They can look at the real... Uh, co community in, in a very quick shot and an area of Roosevelt Avenue on 82nd Street you probably uh, can have 20 to 30,000 people a day walk by there the, the, the huge amount of people there is just astonishing part of Queens is Corona you know and I, and I think you know people fail to realize that the Empire's Casino which is not you know, uh, an active real casino is the highest grossing casino in the state next to uh, Atlantic City, you know, type of casinos. Yep. There are opportunities over there. Do you see that as a, as a market? You know, you were in the hotel business once, you know. <laughs> a lot of people think... I was waiting for that. <laughs> okay. okay. Do you think there's, especially you saw what happened when you built the hotel in Flushing with the, with the need? <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> I, I'm on record as saying in Flushing there's been an explosion of all types of development. And I said mostly mixed use because that's typical Chinese sort of uh, model. Astoria has a lot of hotels. Every yeah. corner is a hotel. So I have, is, I'm not talking. Astoria, in my opinion, to, to be honest, I believe that the Long Island City Astoria market yeah. is too over hotel. And Correct. they open because, you know, everybody said it's the low cost alternative but as opposed to Manhattan. We have the number one property in, in, in Flushing. It's nine, or last year we finished occupancy 95.5% year over year. Hotels. But our, in our hotel, 168 rooms. But the ADR does not break 200. So you have all this new construction, lots of hotels, many of them are not flagged. So the next time there's a downturn, there's going to there's going to be a lot of hotels that are in trouble. Well, also that the hotels people venture to the hotel because the city would allow you access on a zoning if you build it as a hotel. Right. So a lot of these units were built for hotels with the knowledge that they will be converted later on to residential. Right. That happened in Manhattan. I mean, they were building hotels in the middle of the block that really didn't make any sense to me. And you can have few of them at the same block, yes. uh, but they got an extra three or four floors. And the thinking is later on that they will turn in, uh, in, into residential, which I think now the capacity in New York is not as good as you think. I mean, there's less traffic from overseas coming to New York City today. Wow. I think the people who go to Flushing, Different. to the hotels, are the Asian community. Only. Okay, that's, that's you, you, you're uh, not, they're not traveling. Okay, certain there are day trippers, as we would say, going to different parts of mm -hmm. the city. Well, I, I, with the, I think that's generally true in Flushing for hotels, but that's one of the reasons why we flagged Hyatt, and, we have, and that's why I talk about why the flag's important. We do pull a lot from LaGuardia. There is no Hyatt at LaGuardia, so we become essentially the Hyatt Hotel for LaGuardia. You've been involved with residential and retail. Do you think there are opportunities, as I was just alluding, near Corona, I mean, not, not for the hotel business, but maybe for some retail near the... You know, people are at this casino 22 hours a day, okay, because they change the time. 
It opens at 6 in the morning and it closes at 4 a.m. They have a two-hour period of time. The casino is packed. You're talking about at, at Aqueduct? At Aqueduct, okay? I mean, but why at, would that benefit Corona? Corona, right. No, no, I'm not Corona. I'm, I'm talking about... Well, I grew up in Ozone Park, so okay. I'm partial to that. Ozone, Ozone yeah. Park. But you're surrounded by one or two family homes. You're surrounded by the conduit. You're surrounded by a very unique ethnicity in the Guyanese community, Indian community. They share their own houses. They don't come and stay in hotels. So, like you said, you, the hotel... The, the casino, I would venture to say it's mostly day trippers. People come there by bus. They're not going to come sleep overnight and go gamble and go to dinner at the restaurant. I think it's very, very commute oriented. You, you know, the, there's a neighborhood in Queens that we, people are failing to bring up. We talk about Jackson Heights. We talk about Astoria. We talk about Flushing. We far haven't Rockaway. spoken about far, the Rockaways. The Rockaways, you know, and, and I think Alan will appreciate it. It's the same water that yes. you have at the Hamptons, yes. okay? And all of a sudden, those houses, which my friend Michael Dubb built and Vinnie Rizzo on the water, have increased to prices of seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. Okay, is there more development taking place today in the uh, in the Rockaways? Just about every block has something going on in the Rockaways, but you're not getting that luxury product. You're getting mid-market alternatives to. Long Beach to the Hamptons to people buying summer condos and such. You may see a change, Tommy, uh, with the ferry now to Rockaway. Yeah. I think that's a it's huge... It's still an hour to downtown, Mike, uh, Alan. It is, but you don't have to drive that hour. You're Correct. A boat. You're on a ferry. And I'm not talking even about for the weekday commuter. I'm talking about Saturday, Sunday, let's go out to the Rockaways. Oh, it's Saturday and Sunday in the summertime. It's already, it's already there. Right. If you go to all those mid-blocks, the 80s to 116, that were bungalows that were... SROs, those are becoming really nice, and those are all converting. And there's some restaurants open. There's some pop-ups. I think Rocco's Tacos went down there. Mm. Uh, I mean, you have a 60,000 square foot stop and shop in the Rockaways yes. right now. You have additional sh stores being built. Uh, you know, I think years ago, the Rockaways, as we would say for the older <laughs> people here, it was a two-fare zone, okay, if you took the subway. Now, the, qu the benefit of the ferry is important. But something just came out this past weekend about the ferry. They were saying, you know, it's nice to take a ferry, but the ferry only holds 150 right. people. There was a and, line. Okay? And the line was close to 90 minutes. So wonderful with the ferry, the 90 minutes could could have an effect on that. So at the Rockaways, just to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but in the uh, 60s and 70s, my father had bought blocks of oceanfront, beachfront property in the Rockaways. And he had said to me, you won't see anything of, I won't see anything of this in my lifetime, he said, but in your lifetime. And I'm not so sure he's accurate that it's going to be in my lifetime, but <laughs> definitely within the next 20, 30 years, maybe even sooner, the Rockaways are going to be off the charts. But, but where though, Alan? Because if you go down in the 20s, it's the orthodox. Then you go in the 40s, it becomes... That's the, right. There's the housing projects, which are never leaving. Right. And the other side where the water is, it's all... It's all Plume birds and swampland that you can never build. No, so where's it coming? Well, there's a lot. Of, there's Unless a lot the city of does a Willets Point type That's, of thing. Yeah, there. There's a lot of where you're going to need well, highways. Built. To my, my mother and my sister live in Bell Harbor, which is the that other side. That skyline will change. I hope so. But Many you know, years. If you want to go to Many dinner years. right now, if you want to go to dinner in the wintertime, or you want to go buy a pair of sneakers or, or something. because you're you have to Brooklyn thing, or Queens. You have to go to Brooklyn or Queens. You have to get in a car and drive. What about Willets Point? You know... You're involved, you're on the Willits Point Development Committee. Well, we were, we were finalists. I mean, that was awarded to Sterling um, and related. And uh, there are still what's working going on? out I mean, there lawsuits. You, the, you have the number seven train over there. You have, you know, a, a, a relatively good commute to the city. Um, it's a fabulous location. There's, there's environmental acres. issues. There's many things. We that, had a whole concept that we were going to do there, but um, related, it, it, it changed. Now, because they're held up in court, um, and they're working through that, and I understand, I think they're sort of getting to the end of that, but the whole redevelopment of LaGuardia was at a presentation recently. I think the state may come in and take some of that land and, it's like uh, $3 billion uh, and use it for parking there. because they're going to create that, that connection to the seven connection over at uh, over Sky at Train. The, I also uh, think, Michael, that that will impact places like Kew Gardens, Forest Hills, and all of that. Because if you're going to do a mega development there that brings housing and big retail box in there, it's going to take away because that's not really flushing. 
it's independent. Yes, right. it's, I, it's I don't see anybody from other borough, from other areas going to Flushing Main Street for shopping. They're not. No. This only like Jackson Heights, they're only for Fact. themselves. But will its point will bring people in. Our, our experience in Flushing Commons were off the chart in terms of sales and office condo of and residential, which is mostly, uh, it's entirely to Chinese. But we are having, uh, it, it's turned out to be more of a challenge in the retail. We thought we were going to be able, because of the traffic and so forth, that we were going to be able to attract more uh, national and regional tenants. Not coming in. And it's, it's not happening so fast. Eighty percent of it is really food and beverage. Um, and a lot of the regional and national tenants really still are uncomfortable. They need, it, it's a, it is a very different world. It is a very different world. If you go into the suburbs anywhere in the United States, you'll see as much big box retail as you want. Yet New York City, one of the densest places in the world. Right. They, for some reason, they have, unless you're on the right corner that specific, specific to their need. So That's as, why they all come here to vacation. 100%. It's different. Like the to, corner you mentioned is probably the best corner in all of Queens. And Haskell, Jackson Heights at 38. 82nd and 37th and Roosevelt, you don't get better than that. It's probably number two. So, Yet you will, it's, it's almost recession proof as far as it's a, the Amazon, Avenue, there's, the Amazons there's and, 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 and Amazon Prime and all that. Excuse me. Amazon Prime is not affecting that because people are coming down, they're going to go buy their, their shop, their ethnic food, they're going to buy their hookah, uh, whatever it is that they. But they, Haskell said. Michael, I'll have the answer for their retail. Right. What I would do there, I'll bring very high end stores that are not anywhere in Queens with two year leases, three year leases. Take a chance with them. I will bring the Hermes. I will bring the Prada. I will bring all of these people. Right, and on a percentage rent as opposed to a yes. <laughs> fixed rent. No, no, yes. because then the, the tenant doesn't mind because they, uh, their fixed costs are much I, I, I would tell you because they also know the end of the story can be in three years. I'm not on a hook for 10 years. But once the ball starts rolling and these tenants are really doing very good business, they're going to stay there. So you got to give them the carrot, you know? I think, I think what Haskell is saying is a tendency that you, you people in Flushing have not really evaluated because the people who are coming from China and all over... They love that. I'll go back to your original question. How is Flushing different from the 12 years ago? Now you see, you didn't see it 12 years ago. It was a blighted community when I first came there. Um, now you see Lamborghinis and you of see... Of course, and, and we and, see them. I you see know them. what? A lot of the, Those the wealthy places. Chinese coming from overseas, they're getting their house out in the island and they're getting their pied de terre or they They're come, big in Roslyn they, now. We well, see they, them They all? come to Flushing cause, and they buy a unit That's there. That's their home. That's where they can go for entertainment and home. karaoke and food. And uh, Look, Flushing on a weekend is a destination for the Asian community, the tri-state area come for the doctors, they come for entertainment, they come for shopping. I would love to help you with that. I can have the foresight for that. By the way, we did a study on all the banks around 82nd Street, and I was astonished, six or seven banks, the deposits at Citibank, not at the center of the universe, on 81st and Roosevelt, at $284 million. This is in Jackson Heights. I really don't understand. It's this like is when TD Bank opened up a branch in Chinatown, a number of years ago, they had to go extra, extra low. They had to build a double basement because of the number of safe deposit right. boxes that were needed over there. In Flushing, there are more on Main Street. I, I, well, you know, well, the bank of China. There and are more banks per X number of, of blocks, course. whatever the benchmark is in any place in the country. So let's now talk about Sunnyside and Long Island City with a couple of minutes. What do you see as an opportunity in Sunnyside? I think, uh, well, I'm right on the border of Long Island City, Sunnyside, That's why Astoria. I bring up the question. I get a little, uh, I'm a little nervous. I'm seeing a lot of construction, a lot of residential, a lot of real estate coming onto the, a lot of retail coming onto the market. You see retail in Sunnyside? Yes, yes. I think it'll all be absorbed, but I think it'll be, you know, a little bit of a painful trek to get there. Tommy? But I think overall, dynamite. I think dynamite, especially with the extension of the seven train. I think people are looking at Sunnyside, Woodside, where they can come be like a little bit cheaper alternative to Long Island City or Manhattan, and go work on the West Side. You know, to stay on the seven train, get to the New Hudson Yards. I think I think it's a win-win. It's, I think there's a lot of future upside there. I think Sunnyside, if it stays retail only, not residential, it will steal away the customers that are sleeping overnight in Long Island City. They have no place to go. Or the northern part of Astoria, 21st Avenue, all of that. It's really just people driving back and forth, big traffic, 
no people there at night, but this will give you, like Alan, they're trying to put the, the theaters in there, which I think will take care of Long Island City. But Long Island City needs more retail, and there's no retail being done there. It's zero. I mean, there's with, no support with, system. With 14, there's no supermarket. New, there's nothing. With 14,000 new apartments coming to Long Island City, I mean, there's limited retail. I mean, there's not enough supermarkets. I mean, how many people can go rent a Costco to, to, to shop? So I think, you know... It's it, a bedroom community. They just go into sleep and go back to the city. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing to do on a Saturday morning where you don't want to go to the city and you want to have your children play in the park. There's nothing there. You're not... First of all, you can't r walk the streets. To cross the, to cross the street, uh, the construction and the traffic with the Queensboro Bridge, with everything else, yeah. it, it really has an effect. But I think in summation, I think what we're hearing that Queens is booming. You know, Absolutely. people from all over the world, especially, you know, the Asian community are, are coming over there. The Guianan community over there, I think it's there. And especially if you look at what happens with, like Haskell was saying, about Target coming into Jackson Heights, uh, Target also coming into uh, Austin Street. Well, it did, yeah. They you took know, an old barn. They, they, they uh, took over Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble space. Space. So there's been a repositioning, and the city is repositioning, and I think it's all positive effects. Absolutely. And I'd like yes. to thank my executive producer, Mr. Donovan, Tom for bringing Haskell, Alan, and Michael, and I'll see you next week.